Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode on Mind Your Soul. And today we are talking about military boost to becoming a divorce coach. And you must be thinking, what is this? But we have Teddy with us who has proven several times in his life how resilience and strength is the way forward. And thanks for coming on, Teddy. Will you please introduce yourself to our listeners? Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure. Uh, my name is Teddy. I'm a divorce and breakup recovery coach. I help men to find their footing again after their heart get broken. Um, and yeah, that's the basic of me. Yeah, no, that's not the basic. That's what you're doing right now. But I would love like, for our listeners to hear about some of your background, like the journey to becoming where you are today. Like, What's your background? Um, you've been in the military and... You've done some other things as well. I would love to hear some of your experiences that led to becoming the person you are today. Like, why are you in this occupation today specifically? Because you've been through, obviously, divorce since you're a divorce and breakup recovery coach. So there has been going on a lot of things uh, in order to get there. And this is what I want to pick your brain on. <laughs> so I, I graduated from college. And uh, while I was in college, I was working for Bank of America as a teller, which is a cashier, you know, just yeah, yeah. Money, taking yeah, transactions. Yeah. And once I uh, got my degree, I was working in their back office for two years. And while I was working, I realized, like, this is not for me. <laughs> like, I wasn't made to look at charts and just crunch numbers all day. Some people are, but that, that definitely wasn't yeah. for me. And I, when I was younger, I always felt like Iron Man. You know, I was in mixed martial art. I did Muay Thai. So I wanted to incorporate my love for doing physical things into mm -hmm. my everyday work. Yeah. So I had this idea of uh, joining the Marines at first. And <laughs> the, the three times that I actually went to the Marines recruiting office, he, he wasn't there. Actually, the, the third time he was there, but he was just sitting in the corner in the dark looking into space and i was thinking maybe i should disturb him today maybe i'll come back but the uh, every time i went to the marines office the air force would try to recruit me and uh, this guy has a perfect name his name is sergeant friend you know very friendly very outgoing guy you know and he was like why don't you give the air force a chance and i was like it's not that i don't like the air force but you guys have a reputation for being chair force you know like this office workers and I don't want that. And he goes, who told you that? Did you know that we have uh, special forces? And I was like, what? Air Force has special forces? So yeah, come in and I'll, I'll, I'll show you what we do. So I went into his office and he did the whole pitch to me. And uh, he made it seem like, you know, Gordon Ramsay, if you were to apply for his restaurant and he asked you questions like, do you know how to fry an egg? And you say, yes. And you say, you know how to make instant noodles? You say, yeah, of course I can. Oh, you can come work for me. And that's how he made the special forces for the Air Force sounded. He made it sound very straightforward and easy, mm -hmm. which it definitely wasn't. Uh, I no. later found out. So I went in as uh, attack P, which is uh, Air Force uh, Special Forces Command. And okay. uh, I did, uh, I went quite far with it. However, I had an old MMA injury with, with my, my neck that uh, reopened and resurfaced. So um, I, I, I basically quit. And they asked me, well, you could uh, continue and we checked you out, but it's totally up to you. And the person mm -hmm. that I was dating at the time said, I, I know you're gung-ho and you're really uh, into all this stuff, but you have to ask yourself, you're not afraid of dying. I know that about you, but what if you get paralyzed what if you get permanently you know and then what you know you get then you can't train and then you can't be physical anymore yeah. that sort of stuck in my mind and i i went into uh the uh the head sergeant's office and he's a really big dude no sideburns and he just ripped me a new one you know he he basically went to town with me and I felt really small and belittled that day because, you know, they don't take quitters in those kind of places. Mm, so, see. yeah, they, they, they went really hard on me, but my mind was made up. And uh, unfortunately, there, uh, there were only two possible outcomes if you quit from special forces. You couldn't continue with the, the jobs that you were guaranteed for because other than the special forces, you had to take two other 
occupation that you wanted to do in the Air Force. Okay. One was uh, NASA missile control and one was wow. mechanic. You know, either of those jobs would have been sweet and mm. landed me a really high paying job in, on the civilian side when I do decide to get out of the military. But when you get uh, washed out, as they call it, you end up in either security forces or uh, logistics. And I ended up choosing logistics because we used to make fun of security forces. <laughs> no offense to any security forces guys watching, but we used to call them the beret, Walmart beret, because we didn't consider them of, of equal caliber. You know, it's all this military sort of uh, showboating kind of thing. So I did that for five years. My contract was supposed oh, wow. to be for six, but I did it for five because I got out early because yeah. I got married to my now ex-wife. Mm. She's British. So when okay. uh, when we got married, we ended up uh, moving to London. And then when I was in London, I had to start from ground zero again. You know, I didn't have a network. Yeah. I, yeah. I didn't do it my life. So I joined a London law firm. I, I worked my way from the bottom again as a paralegal, got my training, and eventually became an immigration lawyer. And I did oh, wow. that for the better part of a decade. Wow. Uh, <laughs> during which time, you know, my my ex hit me with a divorce. And uh, my now nine-year-old child, she, she was only uh, just over one at the time. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I I had uh, I had a decision to make. You know, if if I was to continue to pursue a career in law, you know, there wouldn't be much time to connect with my daughter because now I no longer have the luxury of coming home to her every day. You know, mm, it's true. Yeah, as a that's single, taking away half of the life. Like I'm also a, a divorced parent, and I miss out half of the time of my kid. Exactly. Right. And I don't know what's of, going on. Like they don't have me every day, so yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, with with being a part time parent, it's that you you do miss half, half of their life, and you want to make the most out of every single moment, every interaction. Absolutely. And I knew that that wasn't compatible with with the path that I was on with law, mm. and then it became more of a necessity rather than a, a life calling. I know there's a lot of coaches out there that say things like, this is my life calling. Like, I always wanted to be a coach. I'm you know? one of them. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I'm the cliche. But anyways, continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't one of them. But, you know, I read someone, I forgot who quoted this, but I paraphrased. Uh, it says, like, you should, you should work in the domain that fits your personality and your skill set the best you know, whatever that may be. And I dug deep and I wanted a job with flexibility. I wanted a job that I can spend time and look after my daughter, uh, make my own hours. So I decided to go into coaching, uh, especially helping men to get back on their feet. And the reason why I chose yeah. it is because I have experience in that. I have experience in a major uh, divorce. You know, it was really messy. I have multiple breakups, you know, throughout my life. And every time... I would feel really low and feel like I'm in despair and I had to re rebuild my life up, you know. Absolutely. From, right. So I have experience yeah. in both love and career wise in terms of rebuilding your life. Right. Yeah. And I know yeah. like it starts with an intention for change and it starts with an intention to make, uh, take you from, from a place where you don't want to be to a place where you do want to be. And I know it's possible because I've done it multiple times, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's yeah. why I ended up in, uh, in coaching. Yeah. Wow. That was a lot of different paths um, that led you, but that's beautiful that led you to coaching. I think we need to have those past experiences in order to be where we are because we, we have experienced pain. And like you said, we had to start over. I've done that too. And that's why I can resonate with my clients just like you. And I think we don't have many men doing what you do. And that's why also one of the reasons I had to have you on, because I, I feel like still it's a stigma in society when, when men get divorced. Like I see many men like um, having bad coping mechanisms, like they just already have a new one before they like fully divorced. Right. It hasn't even been finalized. And then with a new woman, this happens a lot. 
I'm not saying women do not do that, okay? I'm just saying the majority what I see. And I feel like they suppress their emotions because they are men. They're not allowed to speak up. So I, I think it's time to change the stigma around because men are suffering just as much as the women in the divorce. Yes, Everyone absolutely. is processing like difficult emotions and, and, and that needs to come out. Like, and, and people should seek help. There should be like a package when you get divorced, like they, you should be uh, from a government, you should have like a money or they contribute or whatever to having professional help. But we don't have that. People yeah. are just like, oh, just suck it up and continue or whatever, you know. So yeah. I, I think this is important what you're doing, basically. And I haven't seen many coaches like you in that field. Yeah, so, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Basically, when men go through a divorce or a major breakup, you know, it, it change, changes the whole dynamic of their life. And they can Absolutely. either be ways, right? Like mm -hmm. when you just said, when they just bounce back and date a new person without focusing on that emotional healing first. Yeah. That turmoil and that anguish into the new relationship. And that, you know, breaks apart and they wonder why, you know, or they could either go, they, they go the complete opposite way when they just, you know, it's called Magtow, it's called men going their own way when they just completely check themselves out of the dating scene and they don't want to have anything to do with women and they just focus solely on their career and, and on them themselves. You know, which is fine, but in my personal belief is that you can't have a life as a man that's truly thriving and, and has purpose if you're just doing it for yourself. You know, every day when, when I do this, you know, sometimes it's really tough, as you know, with social media, you, you don't even know if, if anyone is actually paying attention sometimes. It's true. The attention span is so low. Oh, my God. It's like one to three seconds. Like, are they even reading it or seeing it? Like, yeah, we don't know. Exactly. But what, what keeps me going is, you know, not only helping people, but also to leave a, a mark, to leave a legacy for my daughter, you know, and to my partner Absolutely. right now. You know, so I also do it for them as well as my clients and as, as well as myself, you know. And that sort of uh, is a pillar that is crucial in the development of being a a, 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 man, a holistic, a whole man, you know, and yeah. you can't be an island. You can't live alone. It's very true. And we're not supposed to. Yeah, we're not like, supposed to. No, we're not supposed to live in this, like I live in Scandinavia and it's very much individualistic culture. It's very much focused on the me and I and the ego. And I don't, I don't believe in that. Like in to certain degrees, it's fine. But we are supposed to be in communities and families and having a support system. We're not supposed to be doing everything alone. And we're not supposed to be single parents. Like that's not like in the old saying is like it takes a village to raise a child. And here I've been doing it alone with three children. And it's been tough. I'm not going to lie. And it still is challenging. But it's like this is not how it's supposed to be, you know. Yeah. So and so yeah. many are doing it without any support. And it's, it's tough. You know, I think because of the society we live in, you know, with the doom scrolling and the social media, yeah, we true. neglect our relationship with other people. And I don't know when it stopped, but men used to confide in each other. You know, back in the Victorian age, there used to yeah. be, uh, you know, men had a large circle of friends where they would come to and, and they would share their ideas and grievances. And then these guys would offer them solutions and help. And I don't know when exactly we switched over from that kind of society to a society where we're so isolated and atomized, you know, and we just, you know, most men go through their, their daily life of quiet, lonely acceptance, you know, so many, I, so many, right. And, and it's more and more every day. And, and it's not the way that we're designed to live, as you said, you know. So uh, my uh, next question is actually, so you work primarily with men, but isn't it like difficult to get them to work with you? Because many of them have a hard time speaking up, like even when bothering them. I have male clients as well, and I've experienced this. Okay, I have I have mostly female clients. They are just easier to work with. I'm just gonna say it as it is, because I have easier and and faster breakthroughs with them than I have with the men. It's not like I don't have it. It just takes a bit longer because they have a hard time sometimes expressing feelings. And once they do, sometimes they feel ashamed. There's shame involved. There's some like the man role is again, they have the man hat on. They don't want to be too vulnerable with me, even though they paid me. 
And I'm like, this is a two way street. Like you have to open up to me in order to get that breakthrough so I can remove trauma or whatever. And then they slowly open up because they need trust and they need to feel safe and remove the whole image of they have to be a man and let go and cry with me. Sometimes they do that, but it takes them some time to get there compared to the female. It's so much faster. So how do you do it, Teddy? How do you crack them open <laughs> to say? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I completely agree with you. It's, it's, it's tough, right? Because yeah. um, women from a young age have been sort of uh, taught um, into sharing their emotions and being open about their emotion. Yeah. Whereas at a young age, is taught to repress your emotion. In fact, if you cry, then you know you, there's all kinds of slurs to, for men who cry, right? But yeah. we are emotional beings. You know, we, we can't neglect that side of ourselves. And when we ne neglect that side of ourselves, we're unable to tap into our true and authentic self. And Very then true. we're just numb to the world, you know, and we're not receptive um, in, in, into absorbing and into growing and into embracing the, the connection, not only with a man and a woman in a dating intimate sense, but with, with you know, people we encounter, period, you know. Yeah, I, th I think uh, it is changing, but it's changing slowly. And with my yeah. own you know i approach them from a standpoint of because men like to talk about a uh, solution solid solution so i talk about solid steps that they can do right before i talk about uh them opening up and and how they feel about doing these things oh so yeah that makes sense because men likes to fix things Right. And they like to build things. Uh, now I'm generalizing, of course, but like I, this is some pattern I've been noticing. Yeah. yeah. That's okay, so that's true. So what 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 is something that you suggest them they could do before they could like will open up to you? Yeah. So one of the things that I uh, try to get them to open up with is I I tell them you know what you consume in terms of food and you put in your body is very yeah. important. Right? So you Absolutely. put in your body, you know, you're gonna have consequences for that. It's the same thing with the mind and with the heart. If you consume things that are uh, pessimistic, you know, and sad, and True. have a sort of a negative outlook of the world, that is mm -hmm. what you're putting into your mind, into your heart. Whereas if you consume, you know, things that make you happy, things that make you feel positive and energized, that is also what you're creating for yourself, right? Yeah. So yeah. I. I, first of all, I just tell them, like, I don't necessarily tell them this is what it's doing. I just tell them, try this, you know. And we spoke uh, last time on my podcast about meditation, you know. And yes, I remember. It's very hard to get a man to sit down and close his eyes, you know. And uh, unfortunately, in the society that we live in, like, a lot of people just equate meditation to some kind of a new age, like, spiritual thing, what hippies <laughs> do, you know. <laughs> Whereas we have to see it differently. We have to see it as allowing the mind to be empty so that we could just, you know, become grounded and refocus on, on what's important. And be able to receive. Exactly. And you exactly. cannot do that when there's so much noise inside of you. And exactly. even though you meditate and it feels like everything is noisy, you cannot focus, still do it because one day you will get on the other side. It takes practice. So many just give up like in the first initial times, they're like, oh, this is not for me. And I'm like, how do you know? You only tried it like three times. Like with the baby, you have to taste the food seven times and you're an adult, you just tried it three times and you gave up. <laughs> you know. So I force them. If they want to be in my program, they got to do it. And at the end, they're all doing it. There's like, nope. I don't take no for an answer. You have to keep trying. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's it's the same thing as working out in gym. You don't see results after just a exactly. Few yeah, and nothing like comes like this. You were in this painful situation for a long time, let's say in your relationship or whatever. And how do you think you're gonna heal just in one day? No, yeah. it's gonna take time. Yeah. Maybe more time, even like that's how it is. Yeah. We have to let go of that instant gratification all the time from social media, as you just said. Yes. So it's the delayed gratification and people tend to procrastinate on delayed gratification because they cannot immediately see the result. The reward system is not activated, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. And the reason why it's so prevalent in our society, because 
you know, these days when you open any social media app, you only see uh, the people who ac accomplish things on their final stage. You don't you have the pain. Got there. Yeah, like, so the true. Memorial, the, the pain that they have to go through to get to where they are. You know, and we live in a society where we shy away from doing the difficult things, right? But it's in the difficult and challenging things that really defines who we are. Is it adds the spice to our mundane and numbness to our life, right? By doing sure. the difficult things, we actually get to enjoy the more pleasurable things. You know, I challenge anyone because I done it myself. You know, I I'm, I'm in a position where if I didn't have to work for a few years, I'll be fine. Right, so I, wow. I do it for a whole Good year. Good for you, Teddy. <laughs> yeah, I'm so I'm like, to I can never with that. <laughs> I'm just trying to uh, paint uh, an analogy, as, uh, show, sharing my experience, basically, that I did spend a whole year of doing virtually nothing. And I just, you know, I hang out with my daughter, you know, we, we go on holidays and we do things together. But I didn't do anything meaningful, right? And I was dating uh, people casually and it was fun, but it was like, you're always seeking the next thrill. You're always seeking the next excitement that uh, is, is, is more pleasurable than the last experience because you're living a life of leisure. You're living a life of, of just indulging yourself. You always got to seek something more sort of pleasurable, right? Whereas yeah. if you live a life of purpose and meaning and it's hard, and it's grueling, you can actually find pleasure in just a simple cup of coffee, you know? That's what I do. And the sun hitting my face because I live in Denmark and we don't see the sun much. So every time it's there, I'm like, oh my God, greeting the, to the sun. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, say, I mean, London is no better. Maybe even I, I know, so we're in the same. Yeah, so when the sun is out, I'm like, oh my God, I'm so grateful for the sun, you know? And I often post this on my story every time because I'm like, I'm so happy that it's out. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, and I always, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I always tell people, just like you said, healing, they ask me, is it supposed to be painful? Yes, it is. Hmm. And it's supposed to be uncomfortable? Yes, it is. Hmm. Right? It is not supposed to be like all relaxing and comforting. No, it's supposed to feel like this. Otherwise, how you get resilient and grow and learn, you know, it's supposed to feel like those things. And we have to push our brains and our body all the time in order to grow. And if we don't like learn something new every day, the brain actually like we have to train it. Right. We have to keep building the resilience in the mind as well. So that's why I say, like, read some paper, like in a new book, learn something new. It could be anything just to keep it going. And now yeah. Alzheimer's studies do prove that we have to keep doing this in order to prevent it. So when we are too relaxed and like boring is not a bad thing. But if you're too comfortable and you're not challenged, then you're kind of losing brain cells. Yeah, absolutely. That's you know, basically what is happening. Yeah. And do you really want that? So you're not contributing to your longevity. You're just dying a bit earlier and, and losing your mind, basically. Yeah, it's so, the same as, as working out. You know, if, if you don't lose same. your lose your muscle, you're going to lose it. Atrophy kicks yeah. in. Yeah. yeah. So you have to constantly not only challenge. stimulate your body, but also challenge your mind. You know, sometimes when I when I take on a new project or I try something new. It's difficult, you know, it's difficult. And, and the the human instinct is not to want to do difficult things. It wants exactly. to do- Exactly, it's lazy, yeah. brain is lazy. <laughs> yeah. But it's in that, it's in that pain, it's in, in that challenge that growth and breakthrough happens, right? Exactly. So I always tell them, yeah, what you're feeling is legit. You're supposed to feel like that. There's nothing wrong. You're not doing something dangerous. Okay, calm down. Because they asked me those questions. It's supposed to feel like this. And, and yes, it is. So yeah. everything new is difficult in the beginning until it becomes a habit or routine of yours. Okay. You have to start somewhere. And the first step is always the difficult one. But once you're in there, you keep going. You keep pushing yourself. Because you can do anything you put your mind to. That's the yes. power of the mindset. And many yes. people... So, like I just went on a live just before a podcast and she was asking me how two people can react differently to the same situation. Yeah. So I took pain as an example, like pain in the arm. 
And I said, one person is telling um, themselves that um, this is very painful and I cannot get through the day with this. Then the pain will grow and be very painful. But the other person has the same pain, okay, amount of pain, but they tell themselves, I can do this. I can work through the pain and I'm all right. I'm still alive. I'm breathing. I'm okay. I'm safe. Then the pain will not be so bad and they will get through the day. That was just a very simple example, but this is basically how it works. You can put two people in the same situation they will act differently because yeah. the one is saying i cannot do it and the other one is saying i can do it mm. that, that reminds me of this <laughs> meme that i saw on instagram where um they asked a millionaire like how did you do it you know and he says my dad was an alcoholic and they asked a homeless guy who was an alcoholic like what happened and he says my dad's an alcoholic you know it's, it's the same stimulus but it had different outcome because of the way they their mindset and the way they 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 choose to use that right mm -hmm. and the thing with men is like you touch upon a point with physical pain men are very resilient uh in dealing with like physical injuries and physical pain you know it's true them. but they're not they're not used to dealing with emotional pain you know and we mental. have to teach them that yeah yes. yeah exactly and it's okay to acknowledge it, you know, and that's, that's the thing that I try to instill in my client. Like, it's okay to acknowledge that you have this pain and you want it to go away. Right. And yeah. if you have yeah. a physical injury, then you would go to the doctors, you know, you, you would get it fixed up. You wouldn't walk, walk around with a gashing wound. Right. But a lot of men walk with an emotional wound that they, they refuse to acknowledge, let alone heal. Yeah. And this is something, again, we should change in society. Like, that's what I always say, like mental pain is invisible, but it's just as valid as the physical pain. And with physical pain, we go to the doctor right away, but with the invisible pain, we tend to procrastinate, procrastinate it. We, we go with it silently, alone. Um, then how are we going to change things for ourselves if we're not getting the help, right? Yeah. So we, we should change this like in society because something is wrong <laughs> this is not how it's supposed to be people are not supposed to suffer in silence like yeah. first step is actually acknowledging just like you said emotions acknowledge that you are in pain and that's yeah. affecting your life because you're not supposed to live uh un, like um a sad or depressed or having all this anxiety you can yeah. actually change things around if you get the right help for it yeah, yeah. I think that there, there definitely needs to be a paradigm shift in society where it's okay you know it's okay to acknowledge that you're not emotionally well you know whether you're female exactly. or male. yeah right? it doesn't matter or or a kid like kids go through a lot of things too when their parents divorce i've experienced that and we got professional help we all did it because i also had to understand what my kids were going through and i was going through my own things so sometimes we don't see what the other person, like the kids or whoever is involved is going through because you have so much of your own pain, right? Yes. So, so it helps to see someone who's objective and saying, you know, your child is acting or behaving this way because this and that. And like, oh, oh, I see. Then I can become a better mother, you know? So Teddy, what advice do you have for our listeners struggling with their own divorces as we speak? Like, what is the first step um, towards like change for them for the better because many are going through this in silence as we talked about so i always advocate for making more connection versus attachment in life and what i mean by that is you can your connection is is part of who you are and it can never be taken away from you right whereas attachment to material things to your career to money to people those things can be taken away from you you know you work uh, all your life in a career and you messed up badly you know they, they you can get fired for that it can be taken from you same thing with love right someone can cheat on you someone can walk out of, of you those attachments should be sort of mitigated and you know and you have to focus more on connecting because you can always connect to people wherever you are you know it starts with an Very hello true. you know it starts with making polite conversation and yeah. in order to do that, you have to first connect with yourself as well. You connect with yourself through meditation, through journaling, yes. and through having honest and open conversations with people, right? Yeah. Because 
can't we can't have uh, true connection without having honesty. And sometimes within honesty, you have to be vulnerable to do that. You can't have be this sort of like stoic show of a man yeah. and expect to make connection with people. You just can't, you know. No. But the yeah. the society that we live in these days, that there's a lot of uh, media out there that tell men not to be vulnerable, tell men not to make connection. You know, everything is, you know, just just focus on your career, focus on making money, and you'll be you'll be immune to everything else. You know, but deep inside, there's a there's a neglect inside of them that they're not fo they're not um, focusing on, and that neglect only grows over time, and you become more sort of resentful and more bitter, not only to uh, the world itself, but like to other people as well. You know, you start to see other people in a really negative light because you're carrying so much on your shoulders, you're carrying so much burden and pain that you can't see past that right and the world is so is, a, is a beautiful place if you allow yourself you know to to see it so yeah they have to let the guards down basically allow themselves to feel and receive because they cannot receive anything if they're holding themselves back right this is how it works basically thank you for that advice i think that was really good and i think what you're doing is admirable and you're like you've gone through it yourself so you're like living and breathing as though i think this is inspiring men can see this is like there is another side you can get there but sometimes we just need like the right guidance mentoring help tools to like go through the, the struggles we are faced with. Uh, and divorce is something that people can like have struggles with for years. Like um, it can take its time because it takes also a time to be married and, and having children involved is even more difficult. And then we are co-parenting is also difficult. So there are like many stages to the divorce, I would say, not just like it's finalized and then you go separate. No, it's like an ongoing process. Uh, so, yeah, it's, thank you. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Especially with men who have kids, you know, and yeah. they try to rebuild their life and they try to date again. You know, it's, mm. it's just as hard as, on men as it is women, you know, a lot of, yeah. I mean, from my own experience and, and clients I talk to you, a lot of women will reject you on the onset when they find out that you already have a kid, right? And uh, some men, what they actually do is they they hide the fact that they they have a kid, even though it's oh, a, that's terrible. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. Oh no. <laughs> I've had stories where uh, you know they they've been dating for six months and then he comes out, you know, with <laughs> with the truth. Oh my right? god. <laughs> And, and then it just uh, it, 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 it puts a dent in the relationship and that trust is, is not there anymore, right? Because it's such a large part of your life, you should embrace it. So I always tell men that whatever uh, baggage that you come with, you know, sorry to say baggage for kids, but you, you know. What I understand you what you mean, yeah. Whatever you, your past that you come with, you, you should be proud of it and you should uh, be honest about it. Because yes. if you're honest about it, you're going to attract and retain the kind of people that would want to be a part of it. You know Exactly. You, you, Otherwise, you're attracting the wrong ones and it's not going to work out because you have this kid's part of your life and that's beautiful. So embrace that instead of like hiding it. That's not a good start, hiding thing. Yeah. And it's, it's, yeah. it's difficult, you know, because it's, it's another element uh, that sort of hinder a lot of men from re-entering the, the dating market you know along with uh, the loss of trust and mm. and betrayal of the previous relationship you know that they're coming into the dating market with all that mistrust right and all that pessimism and it hinders them from making a connection with a new person in their life yeah so it's very important again to like be you and you are good enough as you are. And this is also something with the, with the shame and self-esteem like I've experienced with men is that it's like they feel like their resume is black because of there's like a black spot because of the divorce, but it's not. Like you learn and you grow from those divorces. And, and whoever comes with it, the right person will embrace you and the ones who come with you because it's, it's not about just like, they take the whole package because they can see beyond that. 
and, and yeah, the right person will love you for, for the, everything that you stand for, who you come with you. So it's about attracting the right ones. But the first step is definitely being true to yourself. Like yes, you have to be honest to yourself. Otherwise you're going to attract the other things, right? So exactly. You have to be honest. You have to be proud of your, your, your past. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Instead of feeling ashamed. And this is something I experienced with clients. They're like ashamed. And I'm like, why are you ashamed of your past? Because the past is always teaching us something. We're always learning. So don't turn it into this like victim thing. Like, oh, I was victimized by this happened to me. No, learn from it, grow from it. And then you can, you can become the better version of yourself, basically. Yeah. And so, to some women, yeah. you know, when you, when you show them how devoted uh, a father that you are, what that communicates to them is that you have commitment and you have loyalty and you have responsibility and you have accountability yeah. for your life, right? And th those are really good traits that- Absolutely, uh, powerful yeah. traits, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I would never go for someone who didn't have a kid, I'm just saying it, because I, I think I come with kids and I need some. I, be, I need to be with someone who also knows how that feels, like who already has kids and been through that process himself, because that just makes sense in my head. Because yeah. someone who has not experienced it would not understand how my life is, you know, and how many challenges that I'm faced with. And then, then it would be like a mismatch. So, yeah, I, I think many, many do go for that. But I have experienced some men like telling me like, oh, no, oh, I have kids. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's like, why are you sorry? Then they're telling me like, oh, I cannot go out with you because you have kids, you know? And it's like, wow. Then we're like totally mismatched, you know? It's like, goodbye. <laughs> so basically they, they see it as a, a problem. Like, yeah. 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 No, it's, it's, it's not a, nothing. Uh, if you come with your authentic self, nothing is a problem to the right person. I know. So the they problem? have kids themselves, but they don't want to be with a woman who has kids. So yeah. they want oh. something else. Yeah. Thanks. And that's completely okay. But then you shouldn't have liked my photo or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Because it says I come with kids. <laughs> you know, It's just yeah. an example. I'm not on apps anymore. I got annoyed of it. But I'm just telling you that, um, yeah, hate apps. But I'm just telling you that this yeah. is some of the comments that I got. Mm. Like, oh, you have kids. Ooh, you know, and it's like, wow, you have kids yourself? Like, what is this? Yeah. You know, so I was a bit surprised by it, to be honest. Yeah. Touching on upon apps, the reason why I hate it is it's a very sort of fully <laughs> visual thing. You yeah, know, you it's very uh, superficial. Superficial, you know, and, and you can't really connect to a human being organically just by the photos that they, they choose to put on display, right? Yeah. So I always advocate for guys to approach a woman in real life and uh, there's two That's kinds so of much yeah. so much better yeah so much better and and think about it like for thousands of years we've lived without apps you know we managed to hook up and form families and make connection and all of a sudden we've we've lost that we cannot do it anymore <laughs> yes <laughs> so i don't believe in that more but there's two kinds of approach and i always advocate for a warm approach versus a, a cold approach so a cold approach is when She's totally not looking at you. She, she doesn't seem to be interested, but you try anyway, right? And I don't go for that kind of approach. My kind of approach is when, you know, you saw her looking at you and you smile to test the water and she smiles back. And then you can start up a conversation, you know, because some people might be in relationships already and they don't want, want to be bothered. You should be able to have this self-awareness and an awareness in other people and their body language. You know, it's, it's so as a man to have that sort of um, a, a sense of awareness in, in, in the people that you're interacting with and to gauge their level of interest in you. It's, it's a skill to develop though. Yeah, yeah, and confidence like says everything. So if a man feels confident, a woman will feel safe with you. Yeah. And, and what, it will shine through. It, it would shine through. And you know what confidence display is that you are, you can't be confident unless you're happy with yourself. You can't be confident. So true. I was just going to say it, but it's hard to get there because there's also a step to getting there. It's very true. Yeah. So if, if you're always self-doubting, if you're always yeah. uh, sad and pessimistic and you think the world's out to get you, it's very hard to be confident <laughs> in that situation. 
So it goes yeah. back to what we, we were saying about healing yourself, being happy with yourself, making connection, little connections every day. And it sort of, it gears you up for being able to have that confidence to approach someone who you think might be potentially interested in you, right? Very true. Yeah. yeah. Any final comments, Teddy? This has been amazing for the listeners. Any final comments um, you want to say before we end the podcast? I, I have a quote pre prepared, actually. Oh, I love it. Let's end it with a quote. And it's from the, the Buddhist Thich Nhat Hanh. And a paraphrase, it says, the seed of suffering uh, in you may be strong, but don't wait until you have no more suffering before allowing yourself to be happy. So allowing yourself to be happy starts with a decision to be happy. It doesn't start from outside stimulus. It starts from yeah. within. And so I, powerful. I, yeah. Yeah. It's so true. I always say you have the power to change everything around in your life, but you just have to believe it first. Right? If you already, yeah, like you said, if you don't believe it, yeah, then it's not going to happen. Right? Yeah. Beautiful quote to end the podcast with. Thank you, Teddy. This podcast episode will be on my YouTube channel. I'm going to tag Teddy so you can get in contact with him. He is a divorce and breakup recovery coach. So I think for all the male um, watchers or listeners, uh, this might be helpful going through a divorce or a, a tough breakup. And yeah, and it's also going to be streamed on Spotify and Apple. And yeah, Teddy, I will tag you so they can get in contact with you on Instagram. And yeah, so reach out because if you don't take that first step, then it might take you 10 years maybe sometimes. Like the first step is just having a conversation and taking it from there. And me and Teddy, we don't bite though. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, thanks for your time, Teddy. It was such an honor to have you on. It's so inspiring. And yeah, thank you. Thank you for it. Okay, bye. Bye.